So I want to thank the organizers for uh, the invitation to speak and for arranging this marvelous conference uh, and you know, absolutely first-rate hospitality. And uh, it's evident that there's an enormous amount of work that has gone into it. And so I also want to thank the staff and the PhD students who I can see have done a lot of legwork. So with that, uh, I want to begin. So uh, the, the topic of my talk is quantum classical correspondence for spin, which is a little bit off the uh, topic of, of the other talks. And I'm not sure how it's either fundamental or a frontier, but I then realized that the word fundamental has fun in it. And I've had a lot of fun doing this work. Yeah, OK. I see it now. All right, so I'm, the, the talk is going to consist of three uh, connected stories. And the first story, in the first story, I want you to look at this, this spin Hamiltonian. This is a Hamiltonian in terms of uh, Jx, Jy, and Jz, which doesn't appear, but it is there, uh, which are the components of the spin vector operator. All right? And uh, the magnitude of this spin is 10, which, is, which means that if you want to think of it as a matrix, it's just 21 by 21, 2j plus 1. Uh, however, j equals 10 is, is pretty large. So uh, it's also not a bad idea to think of this spin as a classical vector. And if I do that, then I want to see what the energy surfaces of this uh, Hamiltonian or energy function look like. And first of all, this term is very, very small. You can see how tiny its coefficient is. And it's included for honesty and completeness. But uh, to understand what I'm going to say, we can ignore it. So please do that. And this last term over here is a magnetic field. And uh, let's begin by putting that magnetic field to 0. And then you can see that if I think of this j as a vector, if it points along the x-axis, then this term is, is the square of 10. This is 0. And so the energy is large. If my j points along the y-axis, then the energy is, again, positive, not as large as along the x-axis. And if it points along the z-axis, then both these terms are 0 and the energy is 0, so that's the minimum of my energy. So here is a little diagram that uh, states the same thing. The plus and minus z-axis are the lowest energy configuration, and so those are referred to as easy axes. The plus and minus x-axis are the hard or maximum energy configuration, and plus minus y is intermediate or medium. And here is a contour plot of the energy for zero magnetic field. Now this is plotted on the surface of a globe, and just like a map of the Earth is, is in an atlas, a rectangular diagram, this is some cylindrical projection. The entire north pole is the upper line, the south pole is the lower line. The x-axis is coming out of you in a smack in the center of this rectangle. And this thing over here is the equator. And you can see the energy minima, the lowest energy represented in blue, which is gold, are at the north and the south poles. This is an energy maximum. This is the minus x-axis. Those two are the same. And the plus minus y-axis are uh, saddle points of the energy. All right? And here's the same thing where we've upped the magnetic field a little bit. And now uh, you can see that the energy has actually, the energy minima have moved off the North Pole a little bit. Uh, because if it, were, if it were the North Pole, the entire upper line would be one color. Uh, and uh, the contour plot is not sufficiently fine to show where the, well, you can judge where the minimum is. The maximum that's coming out at you at the, along the x-axis has become a little bit softer. And the maxima along the minus y x-axis that is behind you have become harder. The saddle points with that were along plus minus y have moved in a little bit. Uh, and that's exactly as one should expect. Uh, because when I increase, when I apply a magnetic field over here, and if I think of this as a classical vector, it makes the, 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 the spin or the angular momentum tip over a little bit. OK? And, uh, so let's increase the magnetic field still more. And now you can very clearly see that the minima are off the 
the poles, and uh, this maximum at the, along the x-axis is now a very gentle maximum. Uh, and uh, so I hope everyone has got the, the lay of the land, right? Okay, here's the, the same thing, here's a recap. So here is the sphere on which the spin lives. Uh, the x-axis, remember, is the hard axis, and that's where I'm going to apply my magnetic field. And what that does is it cants the minima away from the north and the south poles towards the, the equator, and those are shown by these heavy blue dots. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and their energies are equal if the field is along the x-axis. And so the question I want to investigate is whether this spin <coughs> Uh, can now tunnel from this direction to this direction. So this is a slightly different kind of tunneling that, uh, than you might have uh, seen before. Maybe some of you have seen this kind of tunneling. Here what I'm talking about is the angular momentum changing its orientation from this way to that way, right? So here's a plot of the energy along the prime meridian. So it's just a schematic. You can see there's a double well. There's an energy barrier, which I denote by U sub B. And the angle between the minima is delta theta. And uh, I want to investigate tunneling from this minimum to that minimum, right? So this is reminiscent of a particle in a one-dimensional double well. Let's look at it over here. And now, for this problem, we know that if we lower the barrier, if we lower the energy barrier, uh, the tunneling becomes easier. So the tunneling frequency goes up, which is the same as saying that the tunnel splitting or the energy separation between the lowest two energy levels, the symmetric combination and the anti-symmetric combination, that energy difference goes up. The tunnel splitting goes up if the barrier height goes down. Likewise, if the distance through which the particle has to tunnel, so that's the distance between these minima, if that goes down, the tunnel splitting goes up. It becomes easier to tunnel. Either one of those two things makes it easier to tunnel. All right. So now, uh, let's see what the effect of this magnetic field is. Uh, we've already seen this. The, the magnetic field makes the barrier height go down. It also makes the tunneling angle go down. There's some critical value of the field at which the, the two minima over here, they merge, so there's no barrier anymore. Uh, but uh, uh, up till that point, uh, the, there is a double well and uh, so I should expect the tunnel splitting to go up, right? The, I hope everyone is with me on that little bit, all right? So this is what we expect. This is how the tunnel splitting should behave as a function of the magnetic field. Uh, this is what we see, okay, on the left. So what's plotted here is that same delta, the tunnel splitting. And by the way, I draw your attention to the to the scale on the y-axis, okay? It's in 10 raised to the power minus eight Kelvin. So this is uh, 10 nano Kelvin, which is one pico electron volt or so by my reckoning. And this is not a time, this is not a variation of anything with time. This is a static, uh, this is a plot of the energy difference between the first two energy levels. It's a, every point on this curve represents a static configuration. Right? I want to make sure there's no confusion about that. We're not seeing time-dependent flip-flop over here. The energy splitting is behaving like this, and the, what I thought, what, we, what I set you up for was that, right? So this is actually a very famous experiment in, uh, in a certain subset of the magnetism community. I don't know if anyone has here in this audience has seen it. So a show of hands, how many people have seen this data? No one. Good. Why do you think it looks like this? So before you ask me questions, I'm going to ask you questions. Anyone in the audience know what is going on over here? Why does the tunnel splitting behave like this? Effect. Yes, please. What is that? It's a effect. That's a good guess. <laughs> Anyone else? What's, what does this remind you of, people? This is two-slit interference. Okay? Uh, and I'll tell you how it's two-slit interference. So the way to calculate tunnel splittings, one of the ways, is, uh, is what's called an instant-on calculation. 
So let's say I want to find the quantum mechanical amplitude to go from some initial direction in which the spin points to some final direction. By the way, I'm going to use this notation where, where a hat denotes a unit vector, not an operator. Uh, so th this is an initial direction. That's a final direction. I want to calculate this quantum mechanical amplitude. Well, the path integral prescription for calculating such amplitudes is, is well known. We find the action for a path that's S of n, and we sum over all paths going from 1 to 2. And uh, this, of course, is an impossible integral to evaluate. And so we say, well, focus on the least action paths, the most important paths, the classical paths, whatever you want to call it, solutions of the Euler-Lagrange equation. And those have a fancy name. They're called instantons. Right? And in this problem, so by the way, now I should tell you this is a real material. It's a magnetic molecule, which is synthesized by, by uh, very non-trivial chemists. This is a feat of, of, uh, of synthetic chemistry making these things. Uh, physicists just refer to it as Fe8. right? And uh, in this particular system, there are two equivalent instantons, which I've shown over here. And you can understand that as follows. Let's say the magnetic field is zero. This is the z-axis. This is the minus z-axis. And the x-axis is coming out at you. Now, the system wants to go from plus z to minus z. It's not going to do this, because that's the, the barrier there is extremely high. Instead, there's an easier way for it to go, and which is this way. There's a barrier on, along the y-axis, which is a little bit lower. But then there's another barrier along the minus y-axis, which is also available to it. So there are two paths which it can take. And when I increase the magnetic field, so the magnetic field is coming out of you along the x-direction. The minima can't. They go towards this position 1 and 2. The paths, which I've labeled A and B, they, they shrink. And as you might imagine, there's a phase difference uh, for the action between those two paths. And uh, the mathematical structure of this phase difference is very much identical to that of the Aronoff-Bohm phase, or if you like, uh, Michael Berry's first example of the Berry phase. And the phase difference is given by the magnitude of the spin, which is j, times the area enclosed by this loop. All right? And uh, so now I have a j of 10 and an area which can be uh, whose maximum value is, is 20, sorry, is 2 pi, right? When the, when the path is this part of the sphere, or that arc and that arc, for zero magnetic field, the relative phase difference is, is 10 times 2 pi, it's 20 pi. As I increase the magnetic field, this, the area of this peanut shape shrinks, and uh, when I have an odd integer multiple of pi, I get destructive interference. When I have an even multiple of pi, I get constructive interference. And so this is the good old two-slit interference pattern. Right? I hope I've convinced you that that's what's happening. So uh, <clears throat> this is very old work, by the way. But I, this is one of the things which I've had fun with, and it will set up what I want to do next. So the moral of the story is that spin path integrals are useful. Uh, See, it would be very difficult to understand this, this data in other ways. One can, but the path integral language and this visual way of thinking about quantum mechanical amplitudes and trajectories is the, is the fastest way I know. So the moral of the story is that spin path integrals are useful. Even more importantly, uh, they are beautiful. So that's end of story number one. And this takes me to story number two, uh, which is connected to the first. So let's talk a little bit more about how one does this path integral for spin. Uh, now you know that the, so this is just a repeat said in words that the quantum mechanical transition amplitude is given by the action for a path. Uh, and then I exponentiate that and then sum over all paths. This is the Dirac, Katz, Feynman prescription for calculating quantum mechanical amplitudes, all right? Now, what do I mean by this action? This is a classical action. The action we all know is the integral of the Lagrangian, and we also all know that the Lagrangian can be written as pq dot minus the Hamiltonian h of pq, and I integrate that with respect to time. That gives me the classical action, right? 
So now, first of all, what do I mean by P and Q in this system? This is, this, I don't have a particle with a position or a momentum, rather I have a spin. So what are my P and Q variables? And uh, remember, I'm thinking classically, because this is a classical Hamiltonian. So well, the spin lives on the surface of a sphere. So I can take the position as the azimuthal angle around the sphere. And then if you remember your elementary quantum mechanics, uh, when we write down the angular momentum operator, the z component of the angular momentum operator has this representation. That's the differential uh, representation for that operator. It's minus i h bar d by d phi. And z, remember, is cosine theta. So the z component, L of z, becomes cosine theta. That's my p. Uh, my q is phi. So that's my, these are my theta and f that's my, these are my p and q variables now related to theta and phi, which are the variables which I use to define the configuration of my spin, all right? So that's my phase space. The phase space for this system is the surface of the sphere. All right, but what is this Hamiltonian as a function of theta and phi? Remember in the very few, first view graph, I showed you a quantum mechanical operator. That was, a, that was an uh, operator Hamiltonian. Now I'm talking about a classical Hamiltonian. Uh, how do I get a classical Hamiltonian starting from a quantum mechanical operator? More generally, if you give me a, an operator of these components of J, I want a C number function, a classical function of theta and phi that is somehow uh, representative or equivalent to this operator F, and I like distinguishing operators by putting a little superscript OP, okay? I don't use hats. Uh, all right, so now there's one obvious way of doing it, which is you take this operator and you take its expectation value in the state where the spin points along n hat. Uh, so let's just take a second to talk about what that state is. So this is the spin state. This is the state in which the maximum projection of the spin is along this direction. So what you do is you start with the state in which the maximum projection is along the z-axis. That one we're all familiar with. So that's you know, your usual jz eigenbasis in which, so for j equals 10, we would take the state with jz equals 10. And then we take that state and we rotate it until it points along this direction. And the spherical polar coordinates of that direction are theta and phi. And so theta phi, this, this label is equivalent to this label n hat. I could write theta phi over here, over here, but n hat is more compact, all right? So I take the state in which the spin is maximally aligned along the n hat direction, uh, whose coordinates are theta and phi, and I take the expectation value of my operator. That gives me a function which depends on the orientation n hat. And so that is one way of getting a C number function, and this, uh, is a well-known way, it's known as the Q map, okay? Uh, there are lots of P's and Q's in this, and uh, that's unfortunate, but that's, you know, I guess we were not very imaginative back then. Uh, so this is known as the Q map. There's another way which is known as the P map, and this is the Sudarshan Glauber diagonal, also known as Sudarshan Glauber diagonal representation. And, and that takes advantage of the fact that these states are coherent states. Uh, just like the ones that you're more familiar with, the coherent states that are based on a harmonic oscillator, uh, these states are also not orthogonal, they're not, they're overcomplete. And because they're overcomplete, if you want to write the operator in terms of uh, a superposition of, uh, uh, you know, an outer product of a cat and a bra like this, you don't need to take n and n prime, you can focus only on the diagonal outer products and weight them with some function of theta and phi, integrate over all the uh, possible orientations for n hat, and then that way you get the operator. So you have to find a function f sub p such that it gives you the operator that you started with, okay? So this is a second way of uh, associating a C number function with an operator. This is known as the p-map or the sudarshan glauber representation, right? And by the way, there's a lovely paper by G.S. Agrawal in 1981 where this is laid out. Uh, all right. Uh, but then there's a third map, and that's the wild map, uh, which you probably more, you may have seen in the, with the words wild ordering. 
So if you're given an operator of P and Q, remember you're supposed to symmetrize it when you write it out. And so that's, then it's called while ordering. More generally, it's actually a map that takes you, that takes you from operators in Hilbert space to functions of theta and phi functions in phase space. All right, so this is a repeat, the first two equations, the Q map, the P map. Uh, now these two maps, they both have, the, they, they have several nice properties. So first of all, they're both linear. Uh, secondly, if the operator is Hermitian, then the function is real. If the operator is the unit operator, the function is the unit function, just one. Same thing over here. Uh, and the normalization in front is adjusted to make that happen. And then both these maps are also covariant under rotation. And what I mean by that is that if you look at this operator in one reference frame, and you look at it in another reference frame, how it's related, uh, how that operator is related in these two reference frames is exactly the same as how the C number function is related in the two reference frames. So the same, so the, the operator and the C number function transform in the same way under the rotation uh, operation. And so that's what we mean by saying that they're covariant. And obviously these are properties that you would like any, uh, any self-respecting function that claims to uh, describe this quantum mechanical operator to have. And by the way, these, these two prescriptions are one to one. So if you give me this function, I can find this operator. If you give me this function, I can find this operator and vice versa, all right? So uh, now there's a third map, which is the while map. And uh, for, <laughs> for systems that have position and momentum degrees of freedom, this map is, is somewhat simpler to define. It's done in two lines in Weil's book in 1928, I think. And, uh, uh, but when you do it, for, when you look at angular momentum or spin, you have to do it in an indirect way. And this is an implicit way of defining the Weil map. And it's through something called Weil, through Moyal's traciality rule. And that says if you give me two operators, F and G, the trace of their product, and then suitably normalized, should be the same as the integral of the product of the corresponding C number functions uh, integrated over the sphere, okay, integrated over all possible directions. And physically what this says is that the quantum mechanical average, which is obtained by taking the trace uh, of these two operators, of the product of those two operators, is equal to the classical average of the product of the corresponding functions. The classical average is an integral over all phase space. Okay, yes? Yes, that is, uh, the, that's further down the road. Okay? So, uh, and the way one implements these maps, the, it turns out that the simplest way to do them is to do it through the spherical harmonic tensor operators. And this is a complete set of uh, standardized operators. They're purely geometric objects uh, with, with the standardized norm. One could also do it through the Fano operators, which is actually what G.S. Agarwal did. But, and I, I should also mention, uh, Professor Agarwal didn't have the Weil map. He only had P and Q. Uh, okay. But if you do it using these, then the whole business becomes childishly simple. Uh, if you start with one of these operators, all these functions uh, over here, they end up just being the spherical harmonic functions with, with constants in front of them, okay? All right, and the next slide is for the specific pleasure of Professor Mukunda. Uh, and this is uh, the, the question of how you go from one map to another map. And uh, so if I start with the Q map, how I go to the W map is I take this object, and this is the Laplacian on the surface of the sphere, so which we you know, which you know from, for example, the elementary exercise of taking the Hamiltonian for uh, the harmonic oscillator and looking at the kinetic energy. There's a radial part to that, and then there's an angular part, which is you know, expressed in terms of derivatives with respect to theta and phi. That's what this thing is. So this is an operator on phase space. It's not an operator on the quantum mechanical Hilbert space. So I take this operator and I calculate some function of that operator and then I calculate the exponential of that function, right? Uh, and I'll tell you what the function is in a minute. And when you do that, you get the while map, right? And if I start with the P representation and 
instead of performing the operation over here, I perform the inverse operation, which is done by just taking the negative, putting minus sign in that exponential, I get the while map again. And uh, so let's, uh, le let's look at this particular statement. The while map is halfway between the P and Q maps, because to go from F to while, I have to do one thing. To go from P to while, I have to do the opposite of that thing. So while is in the middle, P is on one side, Q is on the other, okay? Uh, and what is this function? So this function f is expressed as uh, asymptotic series in inverse powers of j or 2j plus 1. So this is a, the corresponding thing for particles would be to write it as a power series in Planck's constant. Uh, the role of Planck's constant in the spin case is played by 1 over j or 1 over 2j plus 1. So you have to figure out what the correct variable is, whether it's j j plus one, j plus a half, it turns out to be j plus a half, okay? And if you were doing this for particles, then this series would actually have only one term. There would be no, you wouldn't write it as a sum, there would be just one term, and, and it would just be the Laplacian operator on phase space, okay? Now here what we find is, is something more complicated. Uh, so it's actually, it turns out to be given in terms of a, uh, so this is an exact asymptotic result, uh, valid to all powers in J. Uh, and this is, there's a set of polynomials called the foul haber polynomials. And this is the ks foul haber polynomial. Okay? All right. And this is, uh, and somebody asked about the Moyal uh, bracket. So, the, the, so, you know, there's another question that one can ask, which one goes, so let's go back over here. So this says if you give me two C number five, or two operators, then their trace can be given by the product of the three. If you were to put a third operator in here, F G H, and hope that it would the equation would still hold by just putting an H over here, you, you would be wrong. It doesn't work. So if you so the while map, if you know the while map for a function of for two operators, so if you know it for F and you know it for G. Uh, then you ask the question, what is the map for the product FG? It's not simply the map, it's not simply the product of the maps. The map of the product is not the product of the maps, it, in, it entails higher order derivative corrections, just like these things over here, and that's known as Moyal's expansion and gives you Moyal's bracket, and exactly as was said, the leading term in the Moyal bracket is, is just the, uh, is the Poisson bracket, and we can also calculate the higher order terms uh, and, uh, uh, but that would be serious digression. All right, so let's go back to the business of the path integral uh, over here. And so this is uh, what we've seen before to calculate this transition amplitude, which I will call the propagator. Uh, the simplest thing you can do is to just consider the classical path and that gives you S classical, and if I keep only that, that gives me K zero. So that's the zeroth order or classical approximation to the path integral. Uh, and, but that's not enough. The, the full propagator is actually is a, is a series of terms, so there's a, the zeroth order term. The first order term uh, in smallness of Planck's constant or one over J for us, the second order term, third order term, and so on. Uh, now the first order term is, is what uh, one sometimes calls the first quantum correction, and it's absolutely essential to keep this first quantum correction. Uh, it's, it's just not good enough to stay with zeroth order. And you can see this, in, I can say this in two ways, that one also does, another way of doing semi-classics is through the WKB approximation. And in the WKB approximation, the equivalent of the first order correction, the first quantum correction, is the, the overall normalization of the wave function. So that's sometimes called the transport equation and it's responsible for probability conservation, which is obviously a good thing to have. And uh, so you want that, right? And so the first quantum correction is important if you want probability conservation. You can also see it in, in Bohr-Zomerfeld. If you don't include the first order correction, the overall separation between your energy levels will be correct. The separation between the energy levels will be correct, but their overall position will be wrong. So you need that to fix the overall position. All right, so how do we calculate this first quantum correction? So this is slightly technical, and I'm going to just say it in words, and the idea is just to get a flavor of how it's done. So 
what you do is you, you find the classical path and then you consider tiny deviations from that classical path. Now we all know that to first order, the, the action doesn't change. That's what the Euler-Lagrange equations are. And the second order is usually not investigated in elementary books, but it was investigated by Jacobi. And the equation of motion obeyed by the fluctuations is called Jacobi's accessory equation. And the, uh, so that's one way of, uh, that's one part of what is going on. The second way is that you think about this, this expansion, this approximation in powers like this. This is an infinite, this is an analog of the steepest descent approximation, but an infinite number of dimensions. And on one dimension, yes. Yeah, so I is, well, let's, let's say they're all steepest descents, okay? Uh, yeah, they're, 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 they're closely related things. Okay. We will get stuck on technicalities if, we, if I answer that question further, right? So let's say, so now I'm doing an infinite dimensional steepest descent integral. In one dimension, I find the saddle point and I then consider deviations around the saddle point. And uh, what that does is it gives you a Gaussian integral or a Fresnel integral, and uh, which you then do. And now the Gaussian integral is infinite dimensional. So it's a functional Gaussian integral. There's an operator there. You have to find its eigenvalues and multiply them together and work out a determinant. And that determinant is called the Gaussian fluctuation determinant. Uh, and uh, this was, I don't think this is how Fan Fleck did it in 1928. Uh, but this is the answer that you get for the standard Feynman path integral. And the amazing thing is that this determinant can be obtained by solving Jacobi's equation. So the, an infinite order determinant can be solved, can be evaluated by solving a differential equation. Right? Uh, all right, so we now want to do the same thing for spin. We want to find out the first quantum correction. Now it turns out that when you try and do this, this Jacobi method fails. There is an anomaly in this path integral which is known as the global anomaly. Uh, so let me quickly say what that is. The path integral has a symmetry. Uh, and uh, so if you look at that symmetry, you should say the determinant should respect that symmetry. But when you try and evaluate the path integral using Jacobi's method, the symmetry is violated. So it's a real mess and you have to go back and, and really look at the path integral carefully, think about it as a, as a not as an infinite dimensional integral, but maybe as a 10 raised to the power eight dimension integral, do the finite thing carefully and take the infinite number of dimensions limit only at the very, very end. And when you do that, you discover that if you, now remember the whole business was what is the Hamiltonian that I'm going to use? If I use the Q representation for the Hamiltonian, what you find is that the answer is this fluctuation determinant times a factor which, uh, which my colleagues and I, Michael Stone, Kisu Park, and I chose to call the solari kochetov factor. And uh, so there's a correction. If you do the P representation, there's another correction, which is the inverse of the correction that you need for the Q representation. Now the Weil representation is the best of all. The first quantum effects are just given by the fluctuation determinant, and there is no solari kochetov correction. So once again, the wild represent ma the wild map is halfway between the Q and the P, because you see that comes in with one sign, this comes in with the opposite sign, and this comes in with a zero. Okay, uh, I think I should be speeding up a little bit. Uh, I have seven minutes. Okay, cook. Good. Moral of the story. What's the moral of the story? The P map is good. It works. The Q map is good. It also works. We could choose to work with either one of those things. Uh, but the P map is at one extreme, the Q is at the other, the while is in the middle, it's the most symmetrical, and uh, that's the end of that. Third story, uh, connected to the first two. So now, what happens if the operator that I'm looking at is the density operator for a physical system? The while map of the density operator is actually the Wigner function, which uh, I'm sure everyone is familiar with. And uh, uh, now, if I remember the traciality rule, I want to calculate the average of any operator, the expectation value. You know the rule, it's the trace of the density operator times F, and that's the expectation value. And using the traciality rule, I say, I calculate it by taking the Wigner function, finding the Weyl map of this operator F, 
multiplying the two, integrating over all orientations. Okay? That's uh, very nice. So this says you want to calculate the average of any quantity. You, you consider the corresponding classical uh, quantity. That's, what that, that's the meaning of that. And you calculate its average using this function w theta and phi. Of phi. So this is, this is a probability distribution, and that's what I'm doing. I'm just calculating the average. Well, and of course, you know this is not true. Uh, if it were, of course, it would just say quantum mechanics is a classical statistical theory, right? And we could all go home. Uh, and it's not because the Wigner function is not positive, right? So I'm going to relate this now to the spin J EPR experiment. So I have two spin J particles in a singlet space. I measure the spin of one along some direction A hat, of two along B hat. Let's say the outcome of the first measurement is M1, the second measurement is M2, where each of these Ms can be anything, you know, it's minus J, minus J plus one, all the way to J. And uh, I measure this probability distribution by doing this experiment many, many times. And I can also calculate it using quantum mechanics. Uh, and this is the probability, I denote this probability distribution like this. And uh, uh, you all know that uh, you can now calculate, you can write down Bell inequalities and ask if they're violated by the quantum mechanical distribution or not. And these Bell inequalities continue to be violated no matter how large the spin is. So you can take J to be you know, 10 gazillion and this Bell inequality is still violated. You can find values for which it's violated. And there is no objective local theory for any J. So matters do not get more classical in that sense as J gets larger, right? The usual thing we think is that large J is, is classical. I've been selling that to you from the beginning, that idea to you from the very beginning, and now I'm telling you that it's not so. Things do not become more classical as J goes to infinity. At least they don't simply, they don't become classical in a simple way. And so to get classical behavior, what you must do is you must take this resolution, this, this, this distribution, and smooth it or smear it over neighboring M's. And you must incorporate detector error. Uh, and, uh, and this error, by the way, is over and above that which is mandated by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This has nothing to do with that. Uh, so this is, I think this is not a particularly profound statement now. It's many, many people have said this in different ways, that you need to incorporate some error with which to smooth your quantum mechanical observables in order to get classical mechanics. Otherwise, you don't really get classical mechanics directly. This limit is, is nasty. And how to smooth, how much to smooth, this is a difficult problem. This is work I did back in the 80s. I'm sure there's a lot more that has been done since then. I'm ignorant of it. So please, you know, I ask to be excused if I have not referred uh, important developments since then because I simply don't know it. All right. So now let's look at sp the spin J EPR experiment through this lens of the Wigner function because this is now something we could cal we can calculate. We could not do this earlier. So this Wigner function has a very pleasing form. It's just this, so remember now I have a two spin system, so they're going to be, so this is a function of two orientations. It tells, it depends on what the orientation of the first spin is and what the orientation of the second spin is. And this is the standard spherical harmonic for the first uh, orientation. This is YLM for the second orientation. The bar is just a complex conjugate. And the sum over on L goes from zero to two J. Okay, so now as j goes to infinity, you say, aha, this is zero to infinity minus j to j, and every textbook will tell you that that is the completeness relation for the delta function uh, in terms of spherical harmonics. So w goes to delta of n1 plus n2, and that's exactly what you want classically. There's the two spins, they're in a singlet state, and that says the probability for the spin to have this orientation and for the second spin to that have that orientation is zero, unless the two spins are anti-parallel to one another. The overall orientation is not specified, but they have to be anti-parallel to one another, right? That's the, that's the classical singlet state. Okay, very nice. But the problem is that this limit is wildly non-uniform. And what do I mean by that? So here I've plotted the Wigner function for spin five. And this x variable is just minus n1 dot n2. So one can actually rewrite this sum in terms of the scalar product of these two directions. And you see that the Wigner function has a very large peak at x equals one, so this is like a delta function. 
But then it's, it's negative over here. It's, it sort of goes zug, 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 and it has minus signs there. All right, so you say, aha, bigger spin things will get better. So let's do spin nine and a half. Uh, and they don't get better. In fact, the oscillations get wilder. And they get so wild that I've had to truncate this graph. So the, I, the y-axis over here, maybe you can't read, it says 15. The, the, the real thing goes up till 400. So I can't show you the, the, the true, the real peak. The peak has been cut off. Uh, it's just the rest of the oscillations that I'm showing you, which are still wild. Uh, let's go to 50. Uh, if you can read the scale, this is going from minus 40 to 40. The oscillations have become more wild, more numerous, more dense. And this time, if I were to show you the entire range of the y-axis, it would go up to 10 raised to the power 4. Right? So the peak is getting larger and larger, sharper and sharper. But at the same time, the oscillations are going more numerous. They're going wilder. And this thing is not be going to look like it. It's not tending to my standard picture of a delta function in any nice way. All right? So one more picture. So I'm going to take the last 10% of this x-axis and show it to you. Uh, so this is going from 0.9 to, to 1.0. And if you observe the scale of the oscillations, now it's minus 300 to 300. So you can see more of them. But I still can't show you the whole thing, because remember, that thing is 10 raised to the power 4. So all right. So the Wigner function does not get more classical as j goes to infinity. And to make it a nice function, you must now take this Wigner function and smooth it over neighboring orientations. You must smudge it out to make it nice and well behaved and uh, make it positive, i.e. classical, right? And again, the same question, how to smooth, how much to smooth, this is a difficult problem. Right? So now this is getting into speculation, so what I call spin doctoring, right? Or is it, are these two smoothing procedures the same thing? Is, it, is smoothing the Wigner function the same as smoothing my einstein the original EPR distribution? And is there some just right level of smoothing? Because clearly, you know, you don't want to, to, to just blindly go ahead and over smooth, because then obviously everything is going to be simple, right? So you want to do the just right amount of smoothing. And I would expect the answer to both questions is no, but of course I don't know. So as an amusement, uh, what I did was I, I applied this formal transform that takes me from the while prescription to the Q prescription, and I applied it to the Wigner function. So this is. It has no meaning. It's just that I, at least I don't know what the meaning is. So I applied this transform, and this is what happens to the Wigner function. It actually becomes positive, and it, there's a particular value of n1 and n2 when they're parallel to one another, it drops to zero. So it actually it goes all the way down to zero, but it never becomes negative. And so this is this is just right. Okay. Now the the amusing thing is that the same transformation also turns the EPR distribution into something which is positive and is also just right in the sense that it goes down to zero, but it never becomes negative. So, and the amount of smoothing that you need to do in this variable, the fractional projection along the z-axis, or in terms of orientations, is on the order of the square root of 1 over j. Uh, and so, finally, what's the moral of this story? I have no idea. Uh, I'm hoping somebody here will tell me. And with that, let me put up my summary and conclusions, uh, which you can read, but let me just quickly uh, say what they are. So the first part says that the path integrals for spin are a powerful and visual way of doing quantum mechanics. Uh, it's a natural tool for doing semi-classical calculations. Uh, and the formalism for doing these path integrals, by the way, this was my formal motivation that uh, the business of doing s s coherent state path integrals has been around since at least the 1970s. And uh, everyone that you talk to about them, uh, you know, they sort of remind you of that line which was said about Edgar Allan Poe, that this is um, much of madness and more of sin and horror of the soul of the plot. Okay? They're full of trouble. And, uh, but we've sort of slowly chipped away at the problems, and I think we've, we've finally got it. And uh, so there's a good, the second part is that there's a good analog of the wigner weil moyal formalism for spin. Uh, the Wigner function is a classical pseudo-distribution, same pluses and minuses, 
as for standard particle Vignoville Moyal. Okay, and finally, you must incorporate detector imperfections with classical limit over and above Heisenberg. But I don't know if I've, what I've done has any meaning at all. It's fun. So thank you. We've already had a couple of questions, so we have time for one very short question. And, uh, Wait, we have, well. we have three minutes. Uh, Thank you, Prof. No, 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 no. Uh, thank you, Professor Gar, for for a nice talk. I, 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 you just showed if you want to go from point A to B on a sphere, you, in in unitary evolution, you just move on the sphere, right? Yes. So, like, uh, for example, if you move through the inside the sphere, of course, the evolution will not be unitary, and uh, you may need entanglement to perform such evolution. So what I want to say, uh, if you consider the, all the path inside the sphere as well, uh, will they be, you know, like, uh, so uh, which one takes shortest time or something? That, that's what I want to ask, because that may be useful in quantum metrology. Okay, well, I, uh, I've never thought of that, uh, because whenever I try and, so, you know, you have to justify this path integral representation through something like a trotter product formula or writing down the time evolution for infinitesimal, uh, the evolution for infinitesimal times and so on, or the time slice product, and then concatenate those two. And when you do that, it sort of naturally emerges that the states are only specified in terms of points on the sphere. The points within the sphere doesn't look like they have physical, at least I don't see how they have physical meaning at the moment. So they, uh, they, they, they are the pure state only on the sphere and maybe the, limited one, uh, those are coherent state. Uh. Yeah, the states, the points within the sphere, I, at least within the path integral formalism that I have, that not just I, that other people have constructed too, I don't know if it makes, how one would make sense of that. Okay, all right. So Another thank you very much. Uh, we'll have to keep other questions for the coffee break. But all right.